Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to our service this morning. A lovely day to rejoice and give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Let's begin our worship, shall we? Singing Psalm 118, 118. In Scottish Psalter, it's page 398. Psalm 118. And we're singing at verse 15. This is page 398. We can sing down to verse 19. In dwellings of the righteous is heard the melody of joy and health. The Lord's right hand doth ever valiantly. The right hand of the mighty Lord exalted is on high. The right hand of the mighty Lord doth ever valiantly. Psalm 118 verses 15 to 19. In dwellings of the righteous is heard the melody. In dwellings of the Let's join together in prayer. Let's all seek the Lord in prayer. Lord, our God, we thank you for these amazing words where David is so clearly aware and amazed at the fact of your greatness and of your power and of your might describing your irresistibleness in terms of your right hand, that symbol in your word of power and, and speaking there of your right hand being exalted and triumphing valiantly. We see this throughout the history you've recorded for us in your word. We see it in human history and we can see it, no doubt, we hope and pray with thanksgiving to see it in our own lives too. What a thought for us, Lord, today that so many people throughout the villages, neighbors and colleagues and family members even, who, who choose, not because they, they cannot and circumstances make it so, but we're people like we all once were, no doubt, some of us anyway, choosing to not 
think about you or have any real consideration of spiritual things and thinking of life as something that we simply pass through and fulfill without any reference to you. And to think of your greatness and your power and might and how the masses may lie today in ignorance as they have in all of history. But you have revealed your purpose to us in Scripture and how that has become so real and focused and central in the sending of your Son. Through the fullness of time came, you sent your Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that they may receive justification by faith. Lord, that we would have our eyes opened if they've never been opened. And if they have ever been opened, Lord, with David in Psalm 119, we pray, open my eyes, that I may see wondrous things out of your law, that today we may discover the truth as it is in Jesus in a way that we've maybe never seen it or discovered it before. And how the power of faith can be expressed and shown as we think about the last words your servant Paul wrote to Timothy and the certainty and the assurance that uh, your servant faced the future with and Lord for a challenge and a conviction to come to us today as we think of our own lives and maybe how we need to uh, reprioritize in our in our thinking and in our outlooks and so help us we pray as we have this time in your providence to gather round your word and to come under its authority and power we pray lord that your right hand that power would be accompanying your word today we remember what isaiah the prophet said in a way of lament who has believed a report and then he explains that to mean this. Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? What a wonderful thing it is. We cannot see you. With our eyes, we cannot, in a, in a very real sense, perceive you with the physical senses. Though at other times, your presence can be so powerfully real that our bodies are affected. And we do feel something there that Paul says we're about to read that on his first in his, on his first hearing when he had to stand alone, all alone humanly, he said that everyone forsook him, but he said, "You stood the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. How real you can be to our experience and to our awareness. Lord, forgive us for maybe spending time prioritizing the wrong way. And guide us, we pray, into living fellowship with you more and more. We read of Enoch that he walked with God. And he walked with you in the busyness of family. You tell us there in Genesis that it's when he had... Big, um, when he had begotten or when he had fathered many children sons and daughters so he wasn't living in isolation from chaos and noise and reality of family life but it's in the midst of it we thank you for being told that that where we might sometimes feel it difficult or uh, some might struggle with with day-to-day -day situations we thank you for the encouragement that you are able to draw near to your people in the reality of your presence and power and grace. Even in the normal things of life from day to day, you are able to transform them. Our eating and drinking through your blessing may become an act of glorifying your name, something the Corinthians and ourselves are told to do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do. What a thought, Lord, to do everything to the glory of God. What a calling you've given us. 
the world around us that we were once immersed in is doing everything to the glory of self or the glory of an ideology or the glory of a moral degradation and such expressions of human fallenness as in Romans 1 people are doing everything to turn the image of the creator into a creature and making creatures gods in our own image making lifestyles a religion and all of these things we thank you today the gospel is proclaimed and that it's proclaimed every day but particularly according to your appointment the church meets to gather and we know the church will meet in, in different contexts some will be meeting in homes today some may be meeting secretly in fear and concern for their safety and like ourselves here and other places we have the freedom to gather publicly without any concern of um, being stopped or the church being shut or being hauled away and thrown in prison we don't need to worry about having police informants sneaking into the congregation and listening we hear of these awful things in places like china where it has been difficult for some churches to know who's actually sitting beside them but lord we pray that as the church gathers and as your word is read publicly and as it is proclaimed that it will have free course that it will be released let loose as it were and would lead to great glory in heaven that it would be glorified we come lord our god with all our individual and family and uh, church needs and national needs global needs we come before you in prayer and we thank you lord that we don't need to say things to explain we don't need to inform and we don't need to worry about you not understanding what we're trying to say how amazing it is that you know us you know everything about us and the, the relief of not carrying something hidden from you that one day might come out and then things could change but lord we thank you that you've made us and that you have given us life and being you've given us the bodies we have you've given us the personalities we have the gifts the talents and also you've chosen not to give certain things to us that you have to others and how that shows itself sometimes in the church the giftings the qualifications the enablings how some can do some things then they certainly can't do others and the other way round and like uh, the Corinthians uh, are reminded is the picture of the body that one member suffers every member should to feel the pain and that one member can't say to the other I don't need you or even to say to another part what use are you but Paul describes the church as being made up like a body of many different members having many different functions but working together and Lord to give encouragement to any who feel maybe powerless and, and feel so inactive and feel maybe unproductive spiritually but that you Lord would open eyes that we would all see and be encouraged that the Corinthians were reminded at the, at the end of that amazing 15th chapter of the first letter to be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord whatever that work is you've given whether people see it or know it or not but to abound in that work knowing that in the lord our labor is not in vain and it is labor it isn't easy anything spiritual we need supernatural energy and you give it and you promise it and there's times you withhold it and then the whole situation and we in it can feel useless exactly what you've said without me you can do nothing but by our God assisting us we can even overleap walls we can plow through armies like David in Psalm 18 about to sing from 
you can enable your people to do what is impossible. Like in Hebrews 11, the way that amazing chapter concludes, how it speaks about how out of weakness you made people strong. Out of weakness. The strength wasn't there. But the weakness was, and it's into that weakness that the strength came. And Lord, to be thankful to feel weak and to be scared if we feel strong, strong in ourselves and not dependent on you prayerfully. But while it isn't maybe comfortable to feel either physically or spiritually or emotionally weak or feeling these weaknesses may <coughs> lead us to wonder what's happening but through scripture you've shown us so many in fact not so many you've shown us every situation that your people ever be in whether in the psalms or in the histories in the prophecies all the poetic parts of scripture where spiritual experiences is uh, committed to writing we can come and consider these things and there are times it can be such an amazing encouragement to discover our situation in someone else's situation in scripture when it might have been the case that we struggle thinking that no one else no other christian not that they've never been through the situation but that the fact that it's a situation we're going through we might because of how unusual it is think that there's something wrong with us but lord in your word you show us and if we can wait and be patient and prayerful you will reveal these things to us thank you lord for everyone here today there's others who can't be here and <coughs> others who may be in different places we pray for our congregation our homes and all who represent far and near for your blessing lord and keeping on families for the power of your grace and holy spirit to extend into all of our homes all of our families that through your mighty work in their hearts they'd come to discover what we've tried to tell them about that they would discover the truth as it is in jesus and here as we gather lord if we are still on that broad way and still strangers to you that you would reveal yourself to us today and through your word that we come face to face with the living God. We pray, Lord, for those who are all who are sick, housebound, in hospital, all who are in any way under your hand in providence. Speak to their hearts, Lord, give them peace. May they know your presence in such a powerful way. And may their situation even lead them to seek you if they've never sought you before. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who can do for us exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. And we pray with that confidence for others, confident in your promises and in your word when, when we may be going through the, these difficulties, it's hard for us to not to believe that you're able to do great things, but we maybe wonder if you're going to do them for us. But even there, Lord, we look at ourselves too much and fail to understand maybe your grace, that grace that deals with us, not as we deserve, but deals with us for Christ's sake and on the basis of his worth and his righteousness. And so all of our prayers, when we do pray and speak to you and when we pour our hearts to you we think of what we're asking as being for the sake of and in the name of jesus because of him so lord we pray that you will remember us well all we think of today who are sorrowing and mourning families we have met with lord and friends and others who maybe are, have closer relations we are mindful lord of the enormity of these situations and the impossibility of of any human real help not that you do not help us to help 
We're about to read that in 1 Corinthians 1. But that for some people especially, who themselves have been through certain situations, they can help and they can comfort with the comfort they themselves received from you in their trials, the comfort wherewith we have been comforted by God. What a wonderful thing it is. The Lord, that you will give help, and you'll give peace, and that you will grant your blessing. We pray as well for the world around us. There's so much. And uh, we hear of the wildfires and loss of life and devastation of property and how you speak, Lord, in these things, and we, we shudder. And when we, we go home and we can relax or maybe even be able to drive here or walk here and others going into the sea where they live to get away from the flames, and we've got so much. We are so blessed, Lord, to live here in so many ways. We've taken maybe a lot of it for granted. But you have honored your word and your church in this place these islands and Scotland historically the United Kingdom Europe we look at where we are today Lord and we shudder that we have abandoned you and that um, we really are facing the odds as we speak of it humanly but it's there that we, we call to you when the enemy has come in like a flood the Spirit of the Lord would lift up that standard against him. There is nothing you cannot do. There is no one you cannot change. And with the psalmist, Lord, dare we say it is time for you to work. Because men have made void thy law. And we, in a way, in a way think and say as well, and shudder in a way saying it, but at the same time, thankful that in Psalm 74, the psalmist is saying, why do you stand far away? Why are you looking on and why are you letting it happen? And he says, and we say, Lord, that you would take your right hand out of your bosom. Like your hand, your power and blessing is hidden in the folds of your garments, hidden from view, hidden from experience. But to reveal that power, like we've been singing in that opening psalm, Granted, Lord, that your blessing would come in these days and that your kingdom will be established, your church will be strengthened and your people will be animated and enlivened to serve you from day to day. So, Lord, we come into your presence. We ask for you to draw near to us and we may all from the youngest to the oldest, the nearest to the furthest, to the kingdom that we would all be conscious of your presence to discern with, with Jacob waking from his dream and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Lord, for that discovery and that rediscovery and that awareness that church is not a traditional thing of turning up and listening and going home, just doing the thing almost to get it out of the way, but that this would be the place in your house, according to your word and the, the New Testament pattern, that where the church gathers, where two or three meet, that you are there in the midst. So, Lord, speak to our hearts, encourage us, challenge us, and convert us, we pray, as we ask everything in, and seeking forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ, all in his name. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 18. This is in Sing Psalms, and this is on page 21 in the Psalm books. Psalm 18, 1 8. Page 21, we're going to sing from verse 31 to 40. Verse 31 For who is God except the Lord? Besides our God, who is the rock? He is the God who gives me strength, and He perfects the path I walk. He makes my feet like feet of deer upon the heights. He makes me stand. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. In skills of war, he trains my hand. Let's sing down to verse 40. This is from Psalm 18 at verse 31. For who is God? 
accept the Lord. read two chapters from God's Word in the New Testament. Firstly, 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1, and after that we shall read 2 Timothy and chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, your brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. 
For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely toward you. For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. Because, of, because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way back to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no, at the same time. Surely, as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen, to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put a seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. But I call you to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. And we come forward to Second Timothy. Second Timothy, and we can read chapter four and verse one. Second Timothy chapter four. And these are the last words the apostle Paul recorded and uh, they're addressed to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Taking as I have sent to Ephesus, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message 
might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth. I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. May God bless his word to us as we read it together. We're going to turn now to Psalm 16. Sing Psalms. And this is page 17. Psalm 16. We sing at verse 7 to the end of the psalm. The hope that David has in the Lord. I'll praise the Lord my God whose counsel guides my choice. And even in the night my heart recalls instruction's voice. Before me constantly I set the Lord alone because he is at my right hand. I'll not be overthrown. Let's sing to the end of the psalm. Psalm 16 from verse 7. I'll praise the Lord my God. I praise the Lord my God. Let's turn back to our second reading. We'll be looking at both the passages, but for uh, finding uh, a text, shall we look at 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. On that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. 
may be helpful to think for the younger ones to try and follow what's um, happening in this section, in, the, in this um, fourth chapter of Second Timothy, to maybe picture what Paul is doing in encouraging this man, a younger associate. Timothy was someone, uh, you know Paul wrote two letters to him, this is the second one, uh, but in both of them he's encouraging Timothy, who needs encouragement. Uh, Paul is someone who is very strong mentally, emotionally, and it would seem physically, when you read an Acts, some, well, not just Acts, but well, Acts primarily as the history, but to supplement it in 2 Corinthians 12, the chapter dealing with his experience of the, um, the third heavens, he describes some of the sufferings he went through. And it is amazing that he survived them, physically survived them. He was a strong individual. Timothy wasn't. Timothy's someone who had problems with his stomach. And uh, he was advised by Paul to take a little wine to help with the ailment, something medicinal to be appropriate for his sufferings. Sometimes stomach issues are as a result of someone who's got an anxious personality, not always, or going through a time of anxiety and worry can affect the stomach one way or another. And Timothy seems to be that kind of person. And Paul is, as his older associate, he's always helping him, always encouraging him, always giving him that reassurance. But what's happening now, and maybe you can think of it, um, the sports day, think of the relay race, and where you've got to pass the baton on to the person who's coming. The person who's going, at, you're, you're finishing your course, you're finishing your race, and you're passing on the baton to the next person. Or if you want to think of it in a, in a Bible way with Elijah, the prophet in the Old Testament. And when Elisha was going to take his place as God's appointed servant, then there was a passing on, but it wasn't of a baton. It was of Elijah's cloak. It was symbolic of the power of the Lord in that man's life. So what Timothy is, is, is being told here, imagine being Timothy. And being the kind of person Timothy was, needing that assurance and reassurance, well, he is being strengthened through these words that Paul is giving. Paul's writing from Rome. He's writing from prison. This is his last imprisonment. He's not going to survive this one humanly. And uh, he's wanting Timothy to realize that he is now being charged. Uh, isn't that what he's saying in verse 5? As for you, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and there it is, fulfill your ministry. But notice verse 6, the next verse says, for. So what he says in verse 5 is because of what he says in verse 6, meaning Paul is saying, I am going. I'm not going to be here. My time has come. But you have to take the place. You have to take up the charge. And he makes that charge, notice verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. These are the bases, these are the grounds of persuasion he uses. Timothy, think of this. He's going to charge him in verse 2 to preach the word. That is Timothy's calling, to proclaim the word of God. Others have other callings in the church. But the primary calling, you remember in Acts when the deacons were appointed, it was because of a practical issue, an issue involving caring for the needs of people, the widows who felt they were being neglected. Remember the apostles said that you must choose for yourselves men for this calling, for it's not right, he said, that we should leave the word of God and prayer. That was their calling. Others had their other calling. Timothy is to take on, as it were, the baton and to take the next length. He'll be passing it on to someone else. It's like our Lord says in John. One has, some have labored. And you have entered into their labor. Some people and the ministry is, is just plowing the ground. Plowing the ground. Hard ground. That's got to be broken up. You can think of ministries and maybe certain times in history where Certain ministries were maybe quite heavy, and you'd go home, and we felt that at times, maybe throughout our Christian lives, of being stripped of everything we thought we had, and feeling, 
well, and that's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. It puts us back to the Lord. It's not a comfortable thing. The next person can be so encouraging and comforting. And it's, it's like a balance. There's a sense in which, of course, the both should be in every ministry. Where that ministry is an exposition of God's word. The balance should be there. But you know, you know, yeah, we know ourselves that, that there are certain ways of doing things um, because of God's uh, appointment of what people are, are actually like. So think of that as we're going through this. Remember, I don't know uh, how many of you have been in the relay race, but many, many, many years ago, remember being part of that. And it seems to be the illustration Paul is using to Timothy and charging him to preach the word. Because, he said, you are in the presence of God. You are in the presence of Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead. And he says, I charge you by the fact of his appearing and the kingdom. Timothy, it's all happening. The glory's coming. The kingdom is coming. And you must proclaim this message that I've been proclaiming. Because, he says, my time of proclaiming it is coming to an end. So the certainty of Paul is, is quite clear. He knows. He knows this is his last, um, the last part of his life. He knows that, as he says, verse 7, but verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And that is him saying, somewhat like what the Lord said. Remember the Lord said to Peter at the end of John's gospel about Peter's, um, Peter's own death. That when you were young, you dressed yourself and went wherever you go. But when you're old, he said, you'll stretch out your hands. And another will lead you where you don't want to go. And John explains that as Jesus explaining by what kind of death, and this is it, he would glorify God. And by stretching out his hands, the interpretation seems to be that Jesus is telling Peter he's going to be crucified. But the point we're trying to, to, to remind ourselves of is, the Lord said to Peter that your death would be to my glory. Paul is saying his death is like being poured out as a drink offering, a sacrifice to God. He views giving himself to the Lord, pouring himself out. And see, the strings are no longer attached, as it were. However attached they might have been, by that we're meaning, maybe the wrong way to put it. He's, he's, not, he's not being held Remember when, when Martin Lloyd-Jones was in the last stages of, of his illness that led to his passing. He was saying to his family not to pray for him. Don't pray for my recovery. And he said this, don't keep me from the glory. He knew what was coming. He wanted to go. And he didn't want people to pray for him to get better. What a mindset to be in. Paul's there. He's there in, in, a, very, in a very unique and a very special way. Because he's in prison. And this isn't illness. This is execution that's going to end his life. He's going to die a martyr. Give his life as a sacrifice for the Lord. Remember when he wrote Philippians? And in chapter 1, he's talking about... Well, Philippians is, was written by him in his, in his first imprisonment, where the book of Acts finishes. He ends up in Rome, and uh, he's giving his defense um, on his way to Caesar before Felix, before Agrippa... You know the, the way the story goes and when um, Festus shouts, you're, out, you, you're much learning has made you mad and all of that. This is him preaching the word, giving his testimony in, in, the, in the way leading up to his first imprisonment. He was released from that. But when he's in his first imprisonment, Philippians 1, he talks about that he wants to go and be with the Lord. He said, which is far better. For to me to live is Christ, he said, and to die is gain. But he's, he's reasoning in, in his confinement and he's, he's saying to the Philippians, well, what's, what's the best thing? I want to go because that's going to be better for me. But he says, I, I would choose, not that he has the choice, but in his way of thinking and, and his outlook, he would rather stay for the benefit of the church. But the point of what he's saying is that uh, whatever it is, whether by life or death, that Christ may be magnified in my body. Isn't that amazing? This is how he lived. That's the way he faced death. All he seems to be concerned about is that God is honored 
no matter what happens. But the certainty of 2 Timothy 4, something we want to maybe draw um, into, you know, showing something of a contrast with an earlier experience in his life. That's where we read 2 Corinthians 1. The Corinthians were, were a hard law to deal with, a really hard law to deal with. And the, the letters show that. And, and not only that, in, in, um, when he's saying in, in 2 Corinthians 1, he, he's, he's, um, he's on the receiving end of people saying, you can't believe a word he's, he's saying. He said he's going to come, he doesn't come. And he said, look, we're not saying yes or no at the same time. And he's saying to them, in fact, he says um, that it was good that he didn't actually go to them. Because had he gone at that time, where, where is it? Yes, verse 23. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. So he's going to go to these people who are all going on behind his back and saying, he says yes, he says no, he's inconsistent. And he's saying, if I had come, it wouldn't have been good for you. And the reason for that is they were in a state that had to be addressed. He was leaving them in a sense uh, in the Lord's hands. But writing as he is to them, he's reminding them of these things. And in reminding them of the fact that he wants to stop there um, explaining on, on his way. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia. And then I'd go on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, saying yes, yes, no, no at the same time? And he's saying no. The Son of God whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. He's telling them to start thinking right and to stop having problems and to stop making accusations. And he reminds them in all of that of the sufferings he went through for them. There was one part he says the more he loves them, the less he is loved. The more he loves them, the less he is loved by them. He's saying in verse 3 and, and down, um, particularly from verse 8, about a situation that happened to them in Asia. You may want to look into that and uh, maybe you know already or you've got your thoughts about the situation that was being referred to. But he's explaining to them, we don't want you to be unaware of the affliction we experienced in Asia. This is the thing. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That doesn't sound like Paul, does it? It doesn't maybe sound like the Paul of 2 Timothy 4 who's so positive and optimistic and always encouraging. There's always another side. And you maybe know yourself what it is to try and put on the brave face. You don't want to, you don't want to discourage people with your discouragement. You don't want to share maybe or unburden with problems or concerns, but you want to listen. Because sometimes you fear if you say, then either people won't understand or will think you're just complaining. And so you pour your heart out to the Lord and he keeps all your tears in his bottle, as the psalm says, and he keeps a note of all your wanderings. But for Paul, he's saying, look, we want to remind you of this. We were so burdened beyond, think of that language, we despaired of life. Have you ever despaired? Not despairing in the, in the sense of um, factors in life. I don't think that's what he's referring to. I think the despairing is because he was so utterly burdened beyond his strength. And he's saying effectively, Lord, I can't do this. This is too much. The weight is beyond anything that I can cope with. Have you ever felt that? God has his way of doing that. We don't need to be apostle, the Apostle Paul or, or Timothy or Silvanus, but God's people may go through at times these experiences. Another situation, sorry mentioning Lloyd-Jones so much, but there's so much to glean from from what happened around these times and, and what people like that, uh, that great man of God and his, his dear wife was saying, he was speaking one occasion, I think I said this, forgive me if I did, but they listened to a young preacher once and Lloyd-Jones said to his wife, that man is, I can't remember the exact words, but he said that man is, is a preacher and his wife said to him, yes, but he'll be better when he suffered. 
That's what she said to him. He'll be better when he has suffered. Look at Peter. The suffering was self-inflicted. He made a mess of his public profession. It wasn't the end of his life. In many ways, it was the beginning of the rest of his life. And we mustn't ever give up hope about situations like that. But here in the situation Paul is facing, he says in verse 9, this is where we, we want to you know, draw attention to. Indeed, he said, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Some say that this is a situation where he was on trial and he was, but it's not. It's in his heart. And he's saying, our situation in Asia was so utterly burdensome beyond our strength, we, despair, we didn't think we'd survive it. We thought this is such a burden and it's so heavy and it's such a crushing weight. It's like he's saying, Lord, I, am not, I can't live with this weight anymore. And that, I think, is explained in verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received from whom? From God, the sentence of death. Why? Well, we know it's from God because he says there in, in, in verse 9, the second sentence, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So he felt as good as dead, powerless, weak, overwhelmed, utterly burdened beyond the strength. I'd say this to the Corinthians who were going on about things behind his back. And he's saying it for them. He said, by the way, all that happened to us in Asia, where we thought we wouldn't survive and felt we had the death sentence in us, he said, it was for you. It was for your sake. In what sense? Well, there, verses 3 and following, he's explaining, God comforts us, verse 4, in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings or suffering for Christ, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort and so on. But what we're trying to say is there was a point in Paul's life where everything looked like he was going to die. He reached that point, and that's how it looked. And he felt the despair of it, of, 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 of life, of the possibility of enduring and carrying on. But he's looking back on that time. It wasn't the end of his life. In a way, it's the beginning of the rest of his life. And so some situations in our lives might look like they are a dead end and in God's providence we may think the Lord is saying something that's what he's saying see how easily even a great inspired and profoundly spiritual man can misunderstand his situations because he's in the situation where he's saying we felt we had the sentence of death when he actually didn't it's how it looked it's maybe how it felt but he experienced resurrection life through coming to the point of feeling that he was almost dead, weighed down, crushed, and overwhelmed. Be encouraged by that. Let's take it to ourselves in, in prayer. You know what the Bible is? It's not just, oh, this happened to Paul, and you know, that's amazing, but it's to take that to yourself. I do take it to myself. To be honest, there was one time, forgive me being personal, I remember, and it was going through a situation of, moving church while in ministry and coming home and the chapter title on a book a book about the life of Paul was that verse uh, there in, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 we despaired of life itself because the burdens were so great and you know and like you'll know yourself whatever the situation whether it's in times of joy or sadness or trial or temptation the Lord speaks to you and you realize it's almost as though he wrote that verse in the Bible for you. And there's a sense where he did, didn't he? We're maybe so reluctant to take the promises or to maybe more easily take the rebukes because we feel our sin and unworthiness, and, but it's because of his grace. He, de he deals with us because Jesus is worthy and we're trusting in him as our hope, as our righteousness, as our acceptance with God. 
despairing of life itself. But that wasn't the end. And the way things can feel, the way things can look is to be encouraged, to be challenged in our faith, to be prayerful and to be able to say and to believe that this might not be as it looks. And the reason that we can have hope is the Lord himself. But this section here in, in 2 Timothy, he knows what's happening now. There's no possibilities. There's no questions. But see as well how, how difficult he's writing the, these things to Timothy. He's telling them about the people who've turned their backs on him. At, his, at my first hearing when he had, when he had to stand and, and give an answer for uh, his case and for his situation in Rome, he's explaining that, um, verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to stand by him. Imagine being abandoned by Christians. You've been forsaken, the worst time in your life. You've tried to help. You've tried to, maybe some of them could have come to know the Lord through you as a Christian man or woman. And whether it's whatever connection it is, it doesn't really matter. But to, to, to not just feel lonely, but to actually be lonely. And to actually, on the face of the earth, actually have nobody with you at the worst point of your life. Falsely accused, capital crime, facing the emperor of Rome, having to give a, an account of your life, a public testimony of conversion. And there he is as a, as a revolutionary, as one who's inciting rebellion against Caesar, against Rome, against all the standards and things like that. That's what they're saying. And then you'd think the Christians, the church, would rally around him and back him up. You've maybe been alone in situations where you thought you'd be helped. And you expected people to back you up. And they don't. But for Paul, he wasn't all alone. He said, all, not just left me, he said, verse 16, they all deserted me. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? What happened to the Lord the night he was betrayed? I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That's what happened. They all were told, forsook him and fled. But he says, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. He stood by him. It's physical language that he had feet, part of his body, and that his presence was so tangible to Paul. Oh, the Lord was with him. So real as though he was physically present. Isn't that amazing. You've maybe known these times. And it's in the, maybe the isolation and the loneliness and the helplessness of whatever God has in the situation you might face, that it's there he'll meet you. You know the old footprints, um, what do you call it? Um, it's not quite a poem, is it? But you know, you know the thing with footprints talks about how the, the, when there's only one set of footprints on the sand and the man looking back, a woman looking back on their lives and thinking to the Lord, well, why? why why is there only one set of footprints? He says, because it's then that I carried you. It's the picture of God carrying us and upholding and being present at these most difficult of times. But how serious was this? <coughs> Christians deserting Paul, that'd be bad enough. But some of them, like Demas, for example, in verse 10, he, for, he, he went away. And, and, you know, in contrast with the emphasis of this letter, which is talking about the Lord being the judge and his appearance and his kingdom. And at the end of verse uh, 8, people, everyone who, who, the Lord's people who love the Lord's appearing, record the contrast of Demas who loves the present world. We know of Demas earlier. He was an associate of Paul. We can think as well of Alexander the coppersmith in verse 14 who did Paul great harm. So it's not just people not with him, it's people actually doing things to make a situation even worse than it was. See, the Lord stripping him, even there, ta taking everything away from him at his most vulnerable point in life. But do you see, do you detect a vulnerability in, in what he's saying? This isn't to be um, understood as, as Paul complaining or feeling sorry for himself, which you could understand. You could understand. It wouldn't be right, but you could understand. But what, 
what's so important to him is that while everyone else is gone, he says, the Lord is with me. Not just stood by me, but he said he strengthened me. And not just strengthened me, but he did so that through me the message might be proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. His first imprisonment, his first testimony, his first defense of himself. The Lord rescued him. But that's not happening now, and he knows that. And what's his burden? His burden is for Timothy to be faithful, for Timothy to take it up and carry the work forward under God and to be himself a leader and an inspirer, an encourager, someone who is to preach in verse 2 with reproof, with rebuke, with exhortation, with patience and teaching. Because Paul knows the time's coming, people don't want to listen. Having itching ears, it's just curiosity. Get fed up of the Bible. You know, you know that that's how some Christians are. They're really getting fed up. But not Christians, professing Christians. You can see it in, in the professing church. And you know sometimes when, I don't know what you think of this, and politics it never should come into the, you know, don't mean that. And I mean, political or anything like that in the pulpit. But when you have, when you have, for example, well, the leaders, shall we say, of the Church of England, and you have someone challenging the government about illegal um, migration. It just makes no sense. Not the, not the challenging, but someone like that does not have a clue what encouraging this is going to do to our country. It's not going to be Great Britain anymore. to be, uh, And it's not people genuinely, mostly seeking asylum of young men. Not always, but mostly young men reaching how many over 700 this week? What, what are we trying to say? Well, there is someone who is encouraging things that they clearly have no idea about. And it's all under the guise of welcoming in the name of Christianity. This isn't going against what Deuteronomy speaks about. We should, be, we should welcome the stranger in our gates. It's an invasion. That's what it is. It's an invasion. And gangs are behind it. As you know, and this is where we're at, but you have people when they forsake the Bible, anyone, then all kinds of distorted thinking is going to come in. Romans 1, thinking what is wrong is right and what's right is wrong. If we take the Bible and explain, even, even think, well, it doesn't go off on one there, but it's, it's, this is what, I, what Paul is saying to him. You need to enforce the teaching of the Bible. You need to preach the word. You need to, in doing that, be sober-minded, endure the suffering, and fulfill the ministry. But we'll finish as these things he says. When he has already been poured out as a drink offering, that means the time of his departure has come. And he looks at his Christian life, and he looks at his ministry as a fight and as a race. He uses these images. And I, well, some people think that um, when he says, I've fought the good fight, that the fight is is involved in the racing. But Paul also uses boxing and wrestling imagery in some of his writings. And is the picture of being involved in intense wrestling, intense exertion, spiritually. Do we know anything of that? That's a real challenge. Do we know what it is to struggle prayerfully, to struggle in obedience? Not by struggling after failing or struggling through an activity, but struggling in the doing. It's quite a challenge for us. I have fought the good fight. I, he says, have finished the race. He's been running, he's been fighting, and he's come to that place. I have kept the faith. He's saying, Timothy, be inspired, be encouraged. Keep going. And then, as he says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. What is that crown of righteousness? Is it a crown that is given as a reward, a royal reward for righteousness? Or is it a reward that is righteousness? Meaning, glorification. Royal glorification. You can think of it maybe in different ways. But he's told that the Lord will award it to him. 
So it's clearly something the Lord will give. Uh, the illustration of it, a crown of righteousness. What I thought he will give on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What's our own assessment today? If you know, if we were in Paul's shoes, if we were in Paul's situation, there's a sense where we should be asking this of ourselves every day. We don't know when our last day in this world will be. None of us. Paul knew his day was coming. The situation was obvious in his imprisonment, and he knew execution was on its way. And this is how he faced it. See, John the Baptist really suffered in his imprisonment. And it's not to think that every Christian will be soaring with wings like eagles like Paul, or that if you don't in your suffering soar like Paul did and say rejoice in the Lord always, I've learned to accept and be content in whatever state I am. You have a John the Baptist, remember, who questioned the real identity of Jesus. Are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for someone else? That is a really, that's a pit. A right, dark, mental, spiritual, emotional pit. It's dark, it's horrid, it seems hopeless. The Lord's words came back to help him. But his imprisonment, led him to that but Paul's imprisonment led him to this it's to be encouraged and to have that outlook he's saying Timothy bring my cloak it's going to be cold in the winter bring the books especially the parchments what's he thinking about saying Timothy I'm going to die soon but I'm going to keep studying going to keep reading going to keep on with all of this and he says one thing, and then we, 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 we leave. There's so much more in, in the section. So, so much, we've not even begun to scratch the surface. But he says to bring Mark with you. Bring Mark, because he is profitable for me, to me, for ministry. He'd split with Barnabas and Mark, who was his nephew. They'd split earlier on in the ministry. And um, they had a really, really, really deep division over... Um, Mark's failure to see a mission through with him. He went home halfway. He, he couldn't do it. He couldn't stick it out. So Tim, Paul said the next mission, he said to Barnabas, we're not taking him. We need someone who's going to stick in there. And Barnabas, being the son of consolation, he's referred to earlier on in Acts, or the son of comfort, he's kind of saying, Paul, come on, give him another chance. Paul's saying, no chance. But what happened? Well, Paul went one way. The mission with Silas went one way. And the mission with Barnabas, and Mark went the other way. But at the end of his life, he's wanting Mark to come. Bring him. He's proved himself. He's made of real stuff. And he's saying, I want him to be part of this work too. It's amazing. It's a Christian life, isn't it? Sometimes it'll take a long time for all of these splits and divisions to come to a healing. And Christians will one again, once again see eye to eye. It's what we pray for, isn't it? It's what we long for. The church's strength and its power and its fellowship in being together. Not being split. Not being divided up into all of these fragments. But as we're about to sing in a minute in Psalm 133 with the prospect of the blessing of God that leads to everlasting life. There's a groundedness, is there not, in unity the oneness. And the Bible shows us and teaches that there is a oneness. One faith, one hope, one Lord, one God. But more than that, there's one experience. It varies in ways from person to person. But how's it one experience? Well, we read the Bible and it resonates. We read the Psalms, we read other parts of the history, it makes sense. We can identify with it. Beforehand, the Bible was like a closed book. It made no sense. Maybe wonder what's the point of it. But now, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. My words, he said, are life indeed. Life indeed. Well, friends, may we know this. If we have never known it, and to know it more, no matter what's happening, and to be encouraged with the example of this man's faith. Let's pray just now.
Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you for this time. Praying that you'll help us understand your word and embrace it for ourselves and to know its power and its blessing no matter what's happening. And that we would experience these promises, forgive us even saying this, that we would experience them to be true. It's not that we don't know they're true or don't believe they're true. But Lord, when we experience them, whatever that means and to whatever extent, we come to know that the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So hear us, we pray. Encourage us, Lord, and any who need you. We all need you, but in particular ways we think. And grant your blessing as we wait upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing in conclusion, Psalm 133. Sing Psalms 133, page 175. Page 175. How excellent a thing it is. How pleasant and how good when brothers dwell in unity and live as brothers should. Let's sing this psalm, 133, sing psalms. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.